So just click on that little hand raise if that's the case. And Nicole, where do I see that? Do I see that under attendees? Um, I believe it should be under the attendees, yes. Okay, so it's not letting me see. Isn't that disappointing? Um, let's see. We've got... Um, let's say that was about... Well, maybe about half answering. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So graphic organizers, I see that we have one question about what graphic organizers are, and we will be definitely exploring those uh, very fully during our time together. But just a brief overview for uh, any of you that don't know what the term means. It's essentially a visual representation of the organization of text. An outline is a graphic organizer. A Venn diagram is a graphic organizer. So we will be looking at those um, more fully in a, in a bit. And our second objective is that we would be able to, by the end of the webinar and after a little more reading, work effectively with several drafting tools. These are the tools that we all need when we face that blank sheet of paper. And our uh, ESOL learners specifically need support, scaffolding with supports such as sentence and paragraph frames. This is not cheating. This is, in fact, uh, a support system for our learners so that they learn the structures and can uh, they can insert words and, and language that is meaningful for them but within the structure of a paragraph or a sentence so that they learn how to do that and eventually bit by bit we remove the scaffolds. Checklists again come in very handy here because the writer gets to see what he or she should be including in his or her text. And guided questions, I'm sure a lot of you have seen these before, where the questions are layered in such a way that if the student answers the questions in sequence, they can put their answers together to create at least connected sentences and hopefully later a paragraph and then a composition. And finally, we're not quite finally, but our third objective is that as teachers, one of our most important roles is the feedback, the direct instruction that we provide for the L2 writer or the, the uh, non-English speaking writer. So we need to help hone our learner's skills in editing, but we also need to hone our own, determining what it is we will and will not uh, edit for. So rubrics are a big help with that. Rubrics that can come in different um, shapes and sizes, but this is an example, there's a tiny little visual just to show you that a rubric generally is a chart that lets you look at different criteria and determine what the writer has met or not met. Again, back to checklists, very helpful. When at this time in my life, at 58, I find checklists incredibly helpful for my brain, but imagine the learner who's trying to juggle all types of input, the linguistic input, the, uh, the content, the organization, the ideas, all of that, having a checklist provides a, a really great organizing tool for that writer. And then very important is peer feedback because the audience, to whom am I addressing this, this great piece of writing? I need to know if my audience is getting my message. So having peer feedback or in the case of a tutorial session, it's going to be the tutor as peer looking at the content. And then there's also the teacher commentary, which is an important thing for us to look at because whether or not we give the student a correction for every error or tell the student how to find those errors in his or her paper is the difference between an autonomous learner and a learner who is very dependent on his or her teacher. And then here's the secret objective, which is not so secret, which is my hope and the Florida Literacy Coalition's hope that after taking this webinar, you'll feel inspired to encourage your learner or your learners to participate in the Florida Literacy Coalition essay book. And we'll come back to this at the end so you can see where this links you to. But uh, it's a, a great opportunity for your learners to write not only with a very specific purpose, but for a very wide audience. Okay, I'm going to quickly check to see if there are any additional questions. Looks like we're good. So I'd like you to just take 10 seconds to think about how you would personally define writing.
Let's look at uh, a few definitions. So this one is um, nice and clear. A set of visible or tactile signs used to represent units of language in a systematic way with the purpose of recording messages which can be retrieved by everyone who knows the language in question and the rules by virtue of which its units are encoded in the writing system. You all came up with that in your 10 seconds, I'm sure. But this is, at, at its heart, talking about the fact that the writing system that is known by within the context of the people who are writing is what makes that communication effective. So it's a very social situation. And this is something to consider for our learners who are writing in a new context, in a new culture. If they were writers in their first language, some of the things that they knew about in their first language are not going to apply to this new type of communication, this new organization. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Now here's a different kind of uh, oops, different kind of definition. Writing is magical, mysterious, aggressive, dangerous, not to be trifled with. Although it takes many forms, it's always a technology of explosive force, a cultural artifact not in nature, but sprung from the human mind. Two very different types of writing on writing. And one clearly is geared towards the academic audience and, and uh, readers with a particular type of background. One is geared more towards engaging the reader in thinking maybe more deeply about what is behind writing and the power of writing. Something to consider as we go forward. But as I mentioned, because writers have different contexts when they're within their language groups, a learner may be coming into your, your course or your tutorial with a specific idea of what writing should be. And there are some areas where there's quite a difference between L1 and L2, L1 being the first language, L2 being the second language. So in some cases, the learner will be making choices on sequencing or organizing text based on his or her first language. Arabic is in a very flowery, circuitous organization. U.S. English tends to be a very direct, sequential type of organization for writing. So these are things that if we're aware and the author, the student author is aware of these differences, it makes for a gentler transition to the new language writing style. Because obviously the learner writing from his or her first language is not wrong, but this is a new skill, a new type of writing to transition into. This is a big problem. I don't know how many of you have heard about the plagiarism issues that have uh, been in higher ed, primarily, you know, they start sometimes in the uh, IEP programs, but it really goes to that in many cultures there are different ways of integrating original source material in text, and it is not considered plagiarism, it's considered sharing. So we have to share this information with our learners about how to cite, how to bring in other information, how to compare texts. Also, a lot of different language groups look at the reader's role differently. In some cases, everything is meant to be spelled out for the reader. Uh, in our case, we want a logical, by and large in the US, we want a very logical presentation, but we will also make the reader responsible for some of, of the inferences that he or she needs to make. Now these types of things I'm sure you're already aware of, the use of cohesive devices, pronouns, articles, in some cases our learners are coming from languages where these things are not used in the same way. And so they don't have the same skill applying them in first language, in second language writing. And the same thing in terms of linguistic structures. We are very much an active voice society right now, but a lot of cultures have passive voice. That's, it's considered more polite, it's considered appropriate. It's almost the same concept as not making eye contact uh, with some cultures. So what supports do you think, based on what we've just talked about, that ESOL writers need? And these are a couple of choices, and uh, Nicole's going to give you a poll to make a choice on that. You can do this based on your personal experience or based on what you just believe. So you will please click on what you believe the writers need help with. Nicole, is this as many 
different ones as possible, or is this just a single answer? You can just select one. This is single answer. Okay, so you're going to have to pick your number one. Uh, you, we could probably click all of them, but what's your number one uh, opinion of what writers need? Fourth choice. I can see that expressing ideas clearly is leaping ahead. And it's interesting, I don't see anyone responding to, on responding to feedback, probably because of the forced choice concept. So with, with um, you'll see in a minute that, that we had uh, expressing ideas clearly as probably, uh, you know, a, a clear front runner here. And that really will go toward the part of our webinar today where we're talking about self-editing, peer feedback, and teacher editing. Because Initially, you want the learners to get their ideas down on paper, and you, you do want to help them organize those ideas. The organization is part of the clear, clarity of expression. However, in the course of self-editing of teacher and peer feedback, that's where we're going to find that the ideas come across more clearly. We need to think about the writing process, and we're going to do that in a moment. And I see that um, we do have a small percentage of people who are indicating um, punctuation and grammar, which actually can go back up to C in terms of, you know, if those grammar and punctuation errors are making, uh, are interfering with the clarity, that's a very important point. But interestingly enough, very few of you think that learners need um, help coming up with topics, and I, I, would, I would agree with you. Our, our learners have very rich lives that uh, lead to writing. We're going to look at one more. Um, you want to just bring that poll right up? I won't go to the slide, Nicole. So what the next poll that I'd like to ask is, what do you think you need? And again, this is a forced choice, so you're just going to pick one of the five. What do you think you most need help with in order to help your learner achieve effective communicative writing? Now, I'm wondering if we're having the C effect here. <laughs> when in doubt, select C. I'm just kidding, because uh, C is, is leaping ahead with the models for learners to follow. And I think uh, that that model concept, so in looking for models uh, as teachers and looking for models, we're also helping ensure that our, our learners can express their ideas clearly because they're having a model of how to do that. Um, we're not happily spending a lot of time on, um, on writing, on the background information on writing today. Uh, but for those of you that are really interested in seeking that out, the handout that you'll get a link to at the end of the webinar has a extensive bibliography with links to background on writing. It's still a very useful, uh, it's useful for us to have the theory so that we have a, a rationale for why we are practicing what we're practicing. Uh, it looks like very few of you are interested in graphic organizers, so we'll, we'll show that part of the webinar today, but we won't spend a lot of time on it unless there are questions. And the writing frames actually work right alongside the models. Feedback techniques will be something that uh, will just be included as we go along. So, Nicole, I see that you're moving, so I'll wait until you tell me that it's good for me to go. Okay. We will have two time periods for questions, uh, one in the next, by around 10.30, and one at about 10 to 11. Oh, I'm sorry, that's Pacific time. One at the half hour and one about 10 minutes before we end. So this was the question about the supports that you need, so we'll just go past that. The writing process is something that, that uh, I was 
able to talk about a little bit in the last webinar that I did for Florida Literacy, but I think it bears um, reviewing and reflecting upon because I think that we need to be aware of process. The process of writing is much more valuable to us than initially the product is because it's the act of the process that, that improves the product. So if you were looking at these, just take a moment and see where you think they would go, starting from the bottom, moving up, what would be first, what would be next, and then let's take a look at what that is. So this lets you know, as, as, we're, as we're going through and looking at this process, that generating ideas and organizing ideas has to come first before the learners sit down and start drafting. Uh, it's not to say that you can't have a free write or you can't have an opportunity where a student just doesn't do any type of, I'm sorry, doesn't do any type of planning, but if we're looking at the writing process, taking that time to generate the idea, the purpose for writing, then organizing that idea, then doing a first draft, and then doing some editing before the writing is shared, really points out to the student that this isn't a first time you get it perfect. And I think that a lot of our learners are very discouraged when they start to write in their second language because they have a lot to say, but they're, they're struggling with how to say it, not having enough vocabulary. And so if we build this process, they can see that they keep honing and honing and honing this product that they're working on. It's also helpful for the learners to see, see, we have a little bit of a lag. Here we go. It's also helpful for the learners to be aware of the cyclical nature. So yes, this moves up uh, in a hierarchy of tasks, but when we get to the feedback, revision, feedback from the teacher stage, it can cycle back and forth. So it's not just that there's a, a single draft, it's edited, it's revised, it's finished. By the same token, not every piece of writing needs to go through this process. But if you are going to take on, for example, the essay for the uh, Florida Literacy Essay Book, this is an excellent way to introduce this process with your learners. And at the beginning level, we can use this very same process with a group of connected sentences or captioned pictures. It doesn't have to be that we're talking about an essay. It's also very helpful to provide a visual support for this process. As Greg mentioned, I am the author of the Oxford Picture Dictionary, and I I wanted, as a teacher, I wanted a visual representation of the writing process so that I could remind the students what stage they were in. We could talk about what goes on at each stage. So this is a page, and, and uh, you'll have access to this page if you want to be able to um, show it to your learner or if you want to be able to project it. Uh, this, this is, the PowerPoint will be available to you. So this is something that I think is really useful, especially at the beginning level, but frankly, across the levels. We have a lot of visual learners uh, in our classes, and I think taking it to this level is very helpful. Okay, what I'd like you to do now is just take a moment and look at the check the uh, checkbox items and think about which stages of these get the most class time or the most time with your learner and which get the least. I said 30 seconds, but it's really going to be 15. And then I'm going to ask you to reflect on an aspect of that. If you came up with that you spend a lot of time in class generating ideas, but not a whole lot of time doing revising or giving feedback, that could be that you have a lot of tools for pre-writing, but maybe not as many for feedback. One of the things that we tend to do in our instruction is do what we do best, but that may not be as helpful for the process. 
So what I would like to ask you to do is as we go through, and I noticed you know, a lot of you were not looking at graphic organizers as something that you were wanting to focus on. But when we're looking at those graphic organizers, I'd like you to think about how valuable those could be for the learner who doesn't yet have a grasp on the way that we sequence in uh, American English or the way the, the types of cohesive devices that we use or perhaps what elements, what details we need to use to support uh, an argument or a statement. And if you're not making use of graphic organizers, maybe this would be an opportunity to expand it. If you're already making use of graphic organizers, then maybe you want to focus on the feedback aspect. But it's just really important for us to look at this whole picture then go in, zoom in, and look at what elements of our instruction are maybe not as fully developed and think about how that, what effect that has on our student as an author. So let's take a look at some pre-writing tools. If, one, if, if you're in a tutorial setting, then you play the role of the peer, uh, of the colleague, with your learner. If you're in a classroom setting, then for this pre-writing activity, you would pair learners. And this activity is called a Rally Rob, and it's a cooperative learning activity. And you have the students sit face-to-face, -face, or you sit face-to-face -face with your learner, and you basically rally, like a tennis rally, back and forth, ideas, words, or questions related to the topic. It's really useful for learners to be able to brainstorm in a way that's got a, an element of control. So they, they have accountability because they're taking turns, but they're also learning from you or the peer with whom they're working. For schema building or helping learners have the background to start writing, you could also do a round robin, which in this case would require a class setting with at least two or three other learners in addition to the uh, a group of two or three I mean three or four uh, and the the learners just take turns saying associated concepts with whatever topic it is that you are going to have the learners write on now for the essay book there are a variety of topics proposed but one of them is uh, you know a person I admire I believe so if you were going to build learners' schema and perhaps their vocabulary prior to writing as a pre-writing task, you could have them uh, brainstorm in this very controlled round-robin setting, each one taking a turn going around the table, uh, words that describe people that we think highly of, or adjectives uh, in general. And then they could categorize those adjectives in terms of good traits and less than good traits. The round table is done moving into writing. So it's a single sheet of paper and a pencil, and that goes around the group with students saying what they are thinking as well as writing it. This is a little more challenging at the beginning literacy and low beginning level, but you can do that by, by having a list of words on the board or on the, on the table with numbers next to them, and they can select the words that they're interested in or the pictures that they're interested in adding to this list of associated words or concepts with the topic. We, we also really want to be thinking, and this is going to be true much more when we talk about college and career readiness, but it's important now, what is worth writing about? For our learners, what's worth spending the time writing about? So this is um, a survey that learners can do sitting uh, together, and they just you know, put their name down and then they rank, they ask and answer questions to rank these topics. Or you can have them interview a partner and these questions on the left hand side represent topics for the essay contest. So again, you're providing schema building, you're starting the learner thinking about what it is he or she is going to write about and selecting that topic. We know the learners don't necessarily have a hard time coming up with topics, but deciding which topic to write and how to stay on that topic is a little more challenging. I'm going to go quickly through these. Oops, hmm. that's interesting. Nicole, it's going forward instead of backwards. Okay. 
Let me see if I can. I, th I think I've figured it out. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. In the handout, you have these, but these these are checklists that the learner or the tutor and learner or the teacher in, in directing the class can do to, to help narrow down the purpose of the writing. And using this type of language, this meta language about writing, really helps narrow the, the, the learner's thinking so that, that they can then stay focused on the topic at hand and the purpose of the writing. Again, with the audience, and then where the, 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 uh, the, the text will be seen, because that also makes a difference for the register. Here we come to the graphic organizers. If you want to help your learners compare and contrast, if they're going to do a cultural writing, a, a Venn diagram is a brilliant way to get them thinking about elements of one culture and elements of another culture and where they intersect. And see that by giving learners a vocabulary bank, you're letting them start off with some support so they can make use of uh, ways that people greet in both cultures and what, way, what greetings are similar. So you're giving them not only vocabulary support, but concept support. This is another type of graphic organizer that, that walks the learner through what they're to do for each aspect of the writing. So in the first column, we're talking about what the learner is going to do to hook and as an introduction. Then the, the body of the, the writing, and then the summation. Here's a persuasion plan. So what you're doing with these tools is really giving the learner the opportunity to organize in a very concrete way before they ever start to write. And, and we know that especially for academic writing and workplace writing, we want the learner to be successful in communicating his or her ideas, and that takes a certain amount of forethought and planning. And these will become then second nature to the learner. But you mentioned the importance of models, and I, I couldn't agree more. So the first thing we, we need to do is, if the learner is going to be working on writing an email, then we need to find models that are absolutely linked to what the learner is going to write. And where can we find these models? The internet is a fabulous resource now, but there are also many, many writing books. Um, Keith Fulce from Florida has a number of writing books where you can go through and find models of writing. I like to make use of authentic materials because then the learner sees both um, good examples and sometimes not so good examples that they can learn from. It's always great to work from a third party uh, piece of material and tear that apart before the learner starts writing. And then it becomes very important to ask questions about this model to help the learner see how is it organized, what types of language, what types of features are in there. So these are it's not just enough to say, here's a model, and I'd like you to work from it. We have to actually directly teach the content of that model. And to that end, we can use the, the prior essay books as great models for the essays learners will then write for 2015. Here's an example of uh, the pre-writing tool. I used my special place, and as around the side of the um, of the text, you can see that these are the types of questions I would ask. So, speaking of questions, let me take a moment and ask if any of you have any. Um, Jamie, are you getting? Um, are you seeing questions? On yes. The pr the problem is that they were all. Um, they were all, I can't see all of them at the same time, so I'm seeing a number from Neil. Have you been able to answer those? Um, unfortunately, I can't um, take any controls while you're doing the presentation. So you can't see the questions then? Okay. I can see the questions, yes. Okay, okay. So, so um, Neil, I need to know if you can hear still, if you would, if you would write down, I, and I'm, I, okay. He can raise his hand. If Neil, yeah, Neil, if you can Neil, hear. Neil's left. He left, it appears. Okay, okay. so Doris, 
Yes. Can you go back through the slides later? Yes, you can. That's um, Doris asked if it was possible to look through the slides. Yes, because we're doing this in a one-hour setting. Of course, we're moving through it at a good pace. It's an it's more of show and tell. But once you uh, you have the the um, slides in front of you, you'll be able to go through them as well as there's, there'll be a recording. Yes. Yes, we'll put the recording as well as the PowerPoint and all your links. Um, we should have that up on our website. I'm not sure exactly when, but we'll have all that stuff on the yeah. website. And and Gary, the uh, the handout includes all of these tools, all as well, you know, in full size, and as well as uh, I think 16 different full PDFs of writing tools that you could make use of. Okay. Any other questions before we move on? So moving right along to drafting tools, this is something that is in the handout, and it's, it's too small for you to read, but I just wanted to show you, I mean, you can read it, but I don't want you to have to spend the time reading it, but what this does is it breaks down the types of writing tasks that are appropriate to different levels of writers. So novice would be our beginning level, maybe all the way up to low intermediate level learner, depending on their writing background. In some cases, this is really a spectrum. Our learners come in with different skills. So you may actually have a beginning level learner who has studied uh, in a program where everything has been done through reading and writing. And so their reading and writing skills are quite strong, and they have no speaking or listening skills in English. So we need to pay attention to the learner and the learner's needs. But this shows you on the right-hand side what types of strategies and activities are very good for the different levels of learners. And that's very important before you even get to the drafting process. Guiding questions and frames are also an important tool. So here's a picture. I ask these questions. At the low level, I start off by asking these questions. and. As I get the answers, I write this information, so it's almost a language experience. But if I wanted to do this in a more collaborative way, I could prevent, present the questions to a small group, uh, identify a recorder in the group, and the recorder could, could answer these questions, and then the group as a whole could draft a, a paragraph or a set of connected sentences based on these questions. Or, of course, it can go to the individual as well. Below that, you see what's called a paragraph or sentence frame. In this case, it's a sentence frame. So it's giving the student the outline of a very well-constructed pair of sentences. But it's also giving them choices of different words that they would put in on a high academic level. Now, of course, the learner could write at his or her own register about this picture very casual register, but we need to start building up the academic, the more formal register for our learners so that they are more able as they progress through the, our ESOL classes to enter onto the career and uh, post-secondary education pathways. And again, all of this will be, you'll have access to all of this. This is from a book called Right from the Start. You see here not only the guided questions, but a model. So this is showing the student, you start with this orally if you want to, so that you're sure the learners have a grasp of the language and the concepts, but then you can ask questions about the model, which is going to lead them then to draft their own composition based on the questions. This is a, Dr. Kate Kinsella has done a lot of work on framing, and these are, um, you'll have examples of these, but this shows you a more open frame, again, with specific types of language that connect ideas, um, language that is at a higher level for the learner, but that the learner can take on if he or she's not asked to come up with it on her, his or her own. So that was a real quick blow through the drafting. But again, the drafting is the part where the learners are really at the center. So what we can do is provide the tools and then let them go. 
the next stage is where we come into play because this is where we get into the editing. And I know that editing for a lot of us feels very overwhelming and we think in terms of we've got to do everything. But in fact, we really need the learner to focus. So this is from uh, Dana Ferris's work, and she's in the bibliography. She's phenomenal. She has wonderful, wonderful textbooks. They tend towards the academic, but they're very accessible. And her suggestions are to provide strategy training for self-editing. So you keep providing learners with examples of a third-party author's work that has errors. Maybe they're organizational errors, maybe they're grammatical errors, um, maybe they're vocabulary word choice errors. But you give them an opportunity to correct something that is not their own. Then you give them checklists and questions to guide them as they correct this third paper or for their own work. And then you break it down into sections. So the first thing they're going to look at is, did this say what I needed it to say? before they look at copy editing, before they do any of that, it, you know, am I getting the main ideas across that I want to get across, even if they're not gotten across well? Then you can look at the copy, the mechanics. Are the letters capitalized? Are there periods? Then you can go back and look at the organization. So breaking it down for the learner is really helpful. Oh, I had animation. Who knew? <laughs> we'll just review with those arrows. arrows. So this is an example. If you're looking for models of errors, um, the, can, Canada has a website, and it's in the bibliography, of examples of learners' work. So this is an example of a piece that was written by a 12th grader at a very low level of uh, writing skill. But you can see that this is the reason I, I picked the 12th grader was because of more background knowledge, which would be similar to our learners. So if you read through this, it's comprehensible. But now we want to help our learners hone it and make it uh, correct. So if you would, let's see, you would want to think about reading this aloud and thinking about the errors that you see, but thinking about them aloud so that the learners see how the editing process works. For example, last century, people, countries, race to space. People, countries, people, countries. I'm not sure that that, I wonder if nations maybe, or maybe people's countries. I think nations is a better word here. So I actually am modeling what I don't understand in the, in the, um, the sentence and then maybe how I would change it. And then I would actually show the process. Ask questions of the learners. Do you see any spelling mistakes in this uh, text? What parts of this confuse you? And then have the learners make suggestions and you make suggestions. So this has to be a very explicit, systematic process, or learners will not be able to do it with their own work. We read what we think we see, and very often, what we want to believe we wrote. So editing has to be initially taught very carefully. And this is a phenomenal opportunity for learners to, to learn a lot. This is an example of an editing checklist. So for example, is there a title in the center above the paragraphs, yes or no? If the answer is yes, are all important words in the title capitalized? So this is an example of the checklist that leads the learner to editing his or her own work before you ever see it. This is something that, again, I'm not expecting you to read, but I want to show you that it's available. This is a PDF that learners can actually fill in online. So all that light blue area on there is, uh, it's a type of, type inable? Customizable, maybe. I'm not sure what the word is. I've just lost a word. I'm sure you can fill it in for me. But it's the idea that this is a reusable um, online tool, which is very good for our learners' digital literacy skills. Of course, we can also do Word, um, Microsoft Word commenting. You want to set up time for conferencing where the learners work with their classmates and they work with you independently. So you could have 
conferences with learners one-on-one. -on -one. If you're in a classroom setting, if you're in a tutorial setting, of course you're going to have this one-on-one -on -one with the teacher. But see if you can't have an opportunity to work with another tutor and another uh, student so that the students can have an opportunity to read each other's papers. It makes a big difference to have someone else other than your teacher reading your work. Make sure that you teach the peer editors how to appropriately comment on a learner's paper. Compliments, questions, suggestions, then corrections. If, but the corrections should be offered either on a separate sheet or on a checklist, not on the learner's paper. For the teacher's feedback, when to correct, you want to think about, do you want to do it early on? Do you want to do it just before they finally revise their work? Or do you want to do it after they finalized? My choice is to start with an early draft in terms of the content, and then just before their final revision, um, help them with any polishing that they need. But I still like to read each um, each draft. If I have a huge class, that's less likely that that's going to happen and my peer editors are going to have a chance to read more than I am. But you don't want to have it be corrected after the learner has finalized it. That's just too cruel. I don't know how many of you have had that experience, but I certainly have and it hurts because of course you need to go back in and revise it, but your sense was you completed this, this text and now you discover not so much. This is, um, I'm having a hard time seeing this, so I imagine you may be as well, but this is an example of a writing task where the learner is looking at a picture and then captioning. And when you're looking at this, you would try to identify the types of errors. These are the errors that I found in looking at this that you may not be able to see. And I need to decide which of these errors is interfering with the comprehensibility of what the author is trying to say. I don't need to correct every single error because I'm going to give my, my authors multiple times to write and multiple experiences. So I correct for the task and for the purpose of the task, not because I need to put a red pen across every piece of, of text the learner produces. As I mentioned, I have to think about the purpose of the task. So if I'm describing a sequence of events or if I'm showing cause or an effect, in this case, it's captions for the illustrations. So I just want to make sure that I identify these purposes before I start giving my feedback. And one thing you can probably notice is that this author capitalized at the beginning of every sentence, which is a great thing. Periods, not so much. So again, remembering that we have to determine whether or not every error is worth correcting. And my response would be, it's not. Uh, we have to make a determination, but we can also, especially in classroom settings, we can gather the most common errors and use that as a teachable moment and, and help learners move forward in their revision based on a whole class um, response to that error. And here are six ways to move your students towards autonomy. Just give you a moment to read those. And I'm open now for some questions before we go to, okay, I see that Rodney is hearing no audio, but um, Nicole, I'm not sure how to su um, support that. Um, unfortunately, it's going to have to be on his end. I'll, let me see if I'll answer his question. Yeah, well, Rodney is believing, uh, Rodney, I'm Jamie. Um, and I think maybe that there's a little bit of a disconnect about what a webinar is versus a workshop. A webinar is essentially, uh, in, in most cases, it's really a presentation of ideas with an opportunity for you to explore them further with the materials that then are provided after the webinar. We don't have an, inter it's not an interactive workshop opportunity. So 
what I'm asking you to do is, is in some cases, reflect on or look at the material, but it's more of, uh, it's somewhat of a lecture. Would you agree, Nicole? Um, yes, I would say so. Yeah. So if there are any questions about what was shared, otherwise I can go back and, uh, in the next few minutes and just sort of sum up. So what is taking place now is the, the webinar. So for the last hour, I've presented three objectives that will be supported by the written material that you'll um, have access to after the webinar. But the, the three objectives were to show tools for pre-writing and to, to describe them, which were the brainstorming tools, they were the graphic organizers, the concept of reading to learn to write. So reading as a model and then questions that you can ask about the model that help the learner prepare to write, build their schema and also build their understanding. Then the second objective was for us to share tools for drafting. And drafting is that moment when the learner is completely alone with his or her blank sheet of paper and hopefully is taking the notes they've taken during the pre-writing section and from there works with either the scaffolds of a framework, a, a paragraph frame or a sentence frame, guiding questions, or the graphic organizer that they did in the pre-writing to draft a first try at what they want to say about the topic based on the task. And it's really important for us to know what task would go well with which learners. So beginning level learners are more likely to be writing labels or sentences about visuals. Higher level learners are more likely to be writing two or three paragraph essays, maybe five paragraph essays if we're talking about an intermediate, high or advanced learner. And then we get to the feedback stage, which is where our, that was the third objective, was to be able to identify ways that we would give feedback in order to help our learners become more autonomous as editors. So we would provide them with editing checklists. We'd provide them with opportunities for peer editing. And then we, in turn, would provide them with feedback. But not every error, grammatical error, organizational error, word choice error, needs to be addressed. It's addressed based on the task that, and the purpose of the writing. Yes, all of the resources, so I think that maybe people have come in at different times, but um, Karen is asking about the resources. The handout and the resources, uh, how, there, I think we should maybe just put the link in the chat. Nicole, how about that? Can we do yeah, that? I can. I can do that at um, maybe at the end. When well, you're we done with yeah. PowerPoint, I can put a link to um, all the handouts. Um, as for the PowerPoint, I I think we'll probably have that um, available to them online, and I'll send them a link to our website as well. Perfect. So, in order to apply these ideas, which I know have been a whirlwind, but um, the idea is to be introduced to these ideas and then apply them in your teaching and discover your own level with them. Uh, the, using the essays, the essay book uh, with your learners is a great start for modeling and then having them create their own essays using scaffolding, using guiding, guided questions, using all the pre-writing tools is a wonderful way to apply much of what we've mentioned, I've mentioned here. The submission deadline is February 20th. And the, the link to that page is in the chat, so you can link to the page if you like. But also, if you go to the FloridaLiteracy.org um, website, right on the banner, it comes up for the essay contest. You can click on that, you'll get directed right to the essay page. So to restate, today's handout includes all reproducible materials you, that are in the PowerPoint, links to PDFs that you can actually just print out and use with your classes, and key information from the slides. And as Nicole said, she's going to put a link to the PowerPoint 
up as well. So, Nicole, I want to make sure we end on time in respect to everyone's um, time frame. Just going to check and see if we have any new questions. Well, I'd, I'd just like to make one comment, if I could, Jamie. I mean, thank sure. you for the, the excellent session. Uh, I, I want to reiterate uh, or reinforce what you were saying. We certainly want to encourage folks to make a submission or uh, encourage their students to make submissions for the adult learner essay book. Um, if you want to look at older versions, uh, last year's version called Milestones, and, and in fact, I believe this is our 11th uh, annual publication, so we have um, a number of publications going back um, uh, well, most of that time period for years. So if you want to get an idea in what we've found from uh, teachers and tutors in the past, that sharing that publication with their students can kind of help to uh, both inspire them to write as well them, as give them some ideas, because it's a real cross-section of different kinds of writing, some of it's fiction, autobiographical, uh, poetry, and, and so forth. Um, and, uh, and everybody who uh, is included in the book gets a copy of the book. It's a hard cover. I mean, it's a hard bound, um, a nicely done publication. And every program also gets gets a copy. We have some copies available from last year. We don't have a huge number. But if you're interested in having a sample to show to your students, please include a note uh, to that effect in the evaluation that you do at the end of you'll be receiving an evaluation from us. Um, or, or just drop us an email, uh, and we'll see if we can send along a copy of that for you. Uh, and as, as Jamie mentioned, the deadline's coming up. we still got a little over a month. It's, uh, it's on the 20th of February. And we are able to, as part of our conference, recognize some of the authors and have invite authors to come and speak and be part of that event. So it's, it's really a, it's a, it's a neat project to be part of. So with that, is there any, any closing comments, Jamie? Or um, I, I just, uh, Nicole had put up, um, just to give the, the participants an idea of what they're going to be seeing. Do you want to put that back up, Nicole? Sure, yeah. I'll go so ahead. I can just, yeah. So this is the page, when you click on the link that Nicole will be sending you, this is the page that you will see. And all of these, there are, I believe, 16. Um, all 16 uh, of these files are downloadable to your computer and then printable for you to use in the classroom. The writing content standards are very helpful for you to, for you to determine what writing skills you want to develop in your learners. But um, I think you'll see that the majority of them are for the learners to make use of uh, as part of a writing lesson. And the handout is also included. I, I think there's an, another link with the handout as well. So unless there are any other burning questions, but I, I, I uh, encourage you to write me um, at lightheartedlearning at gmail.com. If as you're using the materials, you come up against a question, I'm more than happy to talk with you about it. And Jamie, would you like me to put your email in the chat box as well? Sure, sure that would be excellent. Okay. Yeah, it's not a hyperlink. Right, well, yeah. Okay. Um, when when they when when you get my uh, handout, my email is on there as well. That I I um, if you just go to lightheartedlearning.com, that's the web page. You'll be able to contact me that way as well. Oh, great. Well, thank you, Jamie. We really appreciate your your um, taking the time to share all this great information and, and knowledge and, and all these great resources and tools with us this afternoon. Well, thank you so much. Okay. And with that we'll we'll sign off. Thanks for participating everybody. Take care. <laughs>